Hi Booktube and welcome to a new video. I am going to try and wrap up my March of the Mammoths read which was William uh, Gaddis's The Recognitions, all 956 pages of it, which uh, definitely constitutes being a mammoth and also represents the third of my, uh, basically I'm doing a 10 mammoths this year and uh, I'm three for three. I did finish this technically on the 2nd of April but I'm counting it as I've already started April's mammoth and of all of them, other than perhaps Infinite Jest, this is the most maximalist of, of the ten that I've selected in the sense that it is extremely complex uh, and layered. But I do want to say that its complexity is in two spheres that I don't think should put off potential readers. The first is its um, literariness in terms of what uh, other texts it alludes to. And there's a lot of stuff uh, culled from... Uh, religious thinkers uh, unknown to me as I keep saying I've not been brought up in a Christian tradition uh, but there are other allusions the wasteland which I am familiar with uh, is an informative text of this and stuff uh, but the first thing to say about that is uh, that uh, there is a commentary online that you can have open as I did for all of this uh, by Stephen Moore which has a synopsis of every chapter, a very short, short synopsis, and then the various uh, references and stuff. Now, uh, if you'll forgive the pun, I was not a religious uh, scrutineer of, of every single reference that I didn't know. Once I got into the novel, I basically didn't look much up unless something struck me as particularly uh, significant, even if I didn't know quite in what way. Uh, plus the stuff that wasn't translated from other languages. There's Latin, Hungarian... Spanish, French, although actually my schoolboy French got me through most of the, the, the French bits in here. So the first thing to say is don't be put off by um, the literiness of it because I feel, as I say, I didn't really sort of, I got to the point where I wasn't checking out most of them and I didn't feel I missed out. I didn't think, uh, yeah, obviously if I went and reread and also checked out each reference, I'm sure I would get more. But I actually got a, an awful lot out of this book without having to stop all the time to look up these references. So that's the first thing to say. The second thing that, that makes it complex is it's a huge cast of characters uh, who interact with one another. And, and in a way, in a sort of uh, artifice way, how they keep coinciding with one another, uh, you know, sort of randomly. You know, you, you could you could sort of have a cab on that. Um, but, you know, that type of thing doesn't normally... Uh, uh, worry me and again I feel you don't have to you know keep a, a wall chart of who says what to who who's having a relationship with who who's snubbed who all, and all of this sort of stuff it's written more I think episodically that there are key incidents and scenes and events which are so brilliantly written that they sort of leap out at you as you're reading them so so I think that is enough these, these sort of pivot points or these climaxes are so effectively written that you will get all that you need to know in order to be able to keep moving along as to, as I say, who, the disposition of characters with regard to each other and stuff. I don't think you need to sort of beat yourself up about, you know, not getting every single detail of, of the, you know, these characters and stuff. So there is great complexity in here, but actually I don't think it, it weighs you down as you read through it and as I say particularly if like me you just concentrate on the individual scenes that that are so brilliantly executed that's more than enough to give you satisfaction of, of reading this anyway what is it is about what is it about well it starts off in a, in a really humorous if if tragic way where um a husband and a wife are traveling in Spain uh well sorry they're traveling to Spain uh, on a on a cruise ship and uh, the, the man is a pastor back in in uh, I can't remember I think the Midwest but I can't remember exactly where from and his wife takes him with appendicitis and unfortunately for them uh, the ship's doctor is a fraud he is a man on the run from his criminal background and has forged himself a new identity including a new passport and is traveling on the ship as the ship's doctor when he has no medical qualifications at all and she dies and the husband uh, decides that she will be buried in Spain which is of course a Catholic country uh, much to the chagrin of his sister back home in who is a you know absolute sort of Calvinist Puritan 
is horrified by the fact that uh, her sister-in-law is being buried in a, in a Catholic country. And the, the reverend sort of does a sort of a tour of Spain. You know, he's so sort of deracinated and out of sorts. He does a tour of Spain, ends up staying in a Catholic monastery and things like that. But the actual description of the death, you know, uh, the incompetence of his doctor and, and the reverend's uh, sort of reaction to it is funny. Uh, it shouldn't be, but it is. And then we have the tragedy of their two-year-old son back in the States now has no mother. So this Puritan aunt, Aunt May, is the person who basically is charged with bringing him up because the, the Reverend Father is no father at all, really. Um, and Aunt May one day um, seizes upon some sketches that, uh, that the boy has done and says why are you doing those you know why have you drawn this this picture of this wren which you know uh, Stephen Moore tells us is a, a very significant uh, image in uh, Christian theology but anyway uh, you know only God uh, renders perfection why are you doing this sort of poor second-hand copy of what God has already created and that sets up the absolute thrust of this book which is an inquiry into the nature of art because there is art that recreates that represents that you know the reality of what we see with our eyes and our senses and literally reproduces it you know whether you know to try and understand it or whether to try and illuminate its hidden soul you know whatever the reason you know that is realism and then there is art that is creative that you know creates from the artist's imagination something that has never before existed and the aunt of course stamps down on this because only in her mind only god can create not not sort of flawed human beings but as i say that is the crucial uh sort of conundrum at the heart of this book and at this stage we're also introduced to the uh sort of uh, islamic carpet weaving tradition where a floor is deliberately introduced into the pattern because again only god is perfect that you know no human art can ever be perfect this guy this kid grows up and uh he uh, is basically he's been trained for the priesthood since birth but um, it doesn't work out for him he decides he'd rather be an artist because the one thing that he can do is draw and sketch and paint when he was a ch child he was struck ill bedbound for a year and all he could do was read and paint so uh, he goes off uh, to Paris uh, is approached by an art critic there who I assume is something to do with the French Academy system where they have annual exhibitions this this critic sort of says, look, I can give you a great review, get you, you know, high marks in the academy, and then that will establish you as an artist. And then, you know, I'll take a cut of all your future royalty sales. And uh, this guy, he's called Wyatt, I should say, so the artist is called Wyatt, tells him to get lost. But Wyatt falls into the hands of counterfeiters, two entrepreneurs, uh, Val Basil Valentine, and rectal brown yeah it's a it's a deliberate pun and they uh spot his talent and they want him to do uh, uh forgeries for him and i'll come back to the nature of the forgeries in a minute but brown and valentine have a very competitive relationship because brown's house where they tend to meet up has lots of these sort of art you know antiques and artifacts and curios and they're constantly um basically stealing them and replacing each other and replacing them with with forgeries of them and it's you know it's actually become lost in the in the midst of time as to which is the real and which is the forgery and in, in the end you think they're probably all forgeries that is the atmosphere of the book anyway so uh, Wyatt himself uh inducts us in his art of of, of counterfeiting uh, on the one hand is is the sort of the the sort of technical aspects of things like uh, aging it so it looks like it's come from the 15th and 16th century the paint and the canvas and all this sort of stuff but on the other hand it's it's what he puts on the canvas because although these are counterfeit there's no point counterfeiting something that's already in existence and up in the museum because everyone will just say well no the original is there despite what brown and valentine are beginning up to with each other um, so what he does is he takes elements of existing paintings by well-known paint, uh, artists for the, for the Renaissance and 
he flips the round. So, for example, if a character is is painted in profile, so you see the left side of his face, uh, Wyatt will paint it so you see the right side of his face, and then he will put a pair of glasses from a completely different character in a completely different painting on that character. So it's a sort of um, almost sort of uh, collage effect. So these are in fact new works, but what they are not is they are not originals for the 15th and 16th century. That is the point. But to Wyatt, not only is his sort of forgery art form taken to the highest degree because he has great pride in it, but he does see them as, as you know, the lines of suffering are in every line of paint on the canvas. He really sees it as his mode of suffering and expiation and that he therefore is creating something new, which is to say, in one sense, he is. But in another sense, it isn't because in the style of it's play, plagiarised, although not not directly face to face. So that is the sort of the technical aspects and also the emotional aspects to, to Wyatt, that what he's doing. This is, you know, this is somehow him transcribing his soul. And he has a regular model who is called Esme, who, again, she is posing as a 20th, 20th century woman. Uh, but of course, she's been sort of recreated, represented in these 15th and 16th century style paintings. So she is denied her identity and she has this longing for Wyatt, but he's not interested in her. Whereas every other male in, in, in the city of New York is absolutely drawn to her. Um, and she goes on her own journey throughout the novel, which I'm probably not going to come back to. I'm going to mainly stick with Wyatt. Um, but it's at this point that, that Wyatt has a sort of a crisis of faith. And from this point on, he is never referred to by name. We have to intuit from the text as who's been referred to or as who is speaking. And the reason for this is because Wyatt realises that his identity is being stripped from him. He's, he sees himself as this great artist turning out these great canvases. But of course, it's not about that. It's about the signature of the artist's name, which is not his name. It's obviously these 15th and 16th century painters. And that causes a great crisis of faith in him. And as I say, from then on, his identity is totally crumbled based on the psychology of his tough child of losing his mother at age two, of being bed bound for a year, of his uh, having his aunts uh, bringing him up in an austere sort of Calvinist tradition of having his artwork uh, basically pissed on by his aunt. Uh, these questions of genuine creativity cropping up all the time. Again, you know, he is in his mind, he's forging new, unique works, but it's not it's in a way it's a recreation, not of a direct canvas, but of a one that he's sort of put together, built from from elements of other canvases. And the theme of counterfeiting is not just restricted to art. We have counterfeit money, where uh, the guy who was the uh, fake doctor on the ship, once he's out of jail, he gets into the counterfeiting money business. And there's a hilarious scene where uh, another character called Otto, who's never met his father, has tracked him down and they're due to meet up in this hotel bar. And unfortunately, uh, identities get confused uh, like the identities on paintings, like the identities on checks, all these sorts of things, like the identity of the fake doctor on, on the ship. And uh, that the Otto ends up meeting with the counterfeiter who is there to pass on the counterfeit money to uh, a gangster. So Otto ends up with this counterfeit money. And of course, as he distributes it to the people he does, they get into trouble and, and get nicked by the police. And of course, the gangster has passed it on to the to the wrong person. So there's those elements of counterfeit. But there is, you know, also. There are a, a series of parties, New York arty parties, from which most of the cast of characters are in attendance. And they are all in one way or another counterfeits. They're fake. They're not real people. And one of the ways this is shown is, and I think this is um, a style that Gaddis took to its apotheosis in his next novel, J.R., is there are snatches of, of dialogue, sort of overheard dialogue, as characters walk past other characters in the room. Gaddis gives us these snatches of dialogue. There's also snatches of radio, particularly of radio adverts, 
and Gaddis's ear is perfect, pitch perfect on these little snippets. You build up pictures of the type of people just from one sentence or, or whatever. But at these parties, you realise that the people who are talking, uh, and we only get one sentence off, they are like radio adverts. They are, you know, this is 70 years before what we have now, which is online, you know, your online platforms are a way of your brand, putting yourself forward as your brand. Gaius was doing this in 1952 in this book, that the people attending these parties are pining or giving these, you know, these uh, well-read uh, reference views. They're projecting themselves. This is me, aren't I interesting? Aren't I worth knowing? Aren't I worth taking to bed? You know, brilliant sort of one line branding. Uh, but they're all fakes, you know, they're all empty, they're all vacuous. And a lot of them are quoting, you know, other texts. Otto himself is perpetually accused, he's a playwright, and is perpetually accused of, well, it's not direct plagiarism of your play, but we see, we, it sounds like we've heard it before, and that's never really pinned down. And I think, again, that comes back to this question of the genuineness of art that I think Gaddis is, is after exploring in here. And just as a sort of another example of counterfeit, that someone uh, raises at a party, raises a, um, uh, uh, a sort of a theory that Columbus deliberately forged the maps so that his crew didn't know where he was going, but he knew exactly uh, where he was going to America. So that even somehow the foundation of America itself is based on forgeries, based on false maps. Uh, this notion that he was sailing for India, but ended up in America. You know, so sort of mistaken identity, non-recognition, as in the non-recognition of a counterfeiter and, and Otto's dad, uh, and Otto not recognising the other for who they really were. So, you know, layer upon layer upon layer of fakeness, counterfeitness, hollowness, true art versus false art. Um, and it's very funny. There's a lot, you know. It is of its time, you know, I think nowadays people would, you know, could get offended by the humour. But, you know, for 1952, you know, the butt of the jokes here, or re it's not really jokes, it's much more about sort of satirical uh, sort of events and set pieces, you know, turned up to 11. Um, that, and they're very funny. They are very funny. But just before I, 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 I talk about, you know, the, the greatness of the writing... I just wanted to give another example. So America has been spared the whole sort of tradition of religious art of the, med the, you know, the medieval period and Renaissance art and all of this sort of stuff. Because although America was a Christian society fairly early on, once it had been settled by, by uh, white settlers, it was pretty much, because it was a Puritan culture, it was not really producing this sort of Baroque or Gothic art um of of the sort of religious uh you know great art of, of europe and yet america now being the center of the art world because it, it has so much money it has so many institutions not only museums but universities have the spending power to buy these great art pieces of great art when when they arise um it's almost as though america wants to buy a sort of uh, a, a, a sort of christian religious art founding sort of set of myths and it's very interesting that the, the paintings that are counterfeited in here feed into that because they are from that period those are the ones being counterfeited and I was very interested in that idea of America not having you know the the, the depth of of sort of western uh, Christian tradition almost is trying to buy one and replicate it and forge it I mean the whole concept of America having a religious tradition in art in visual art is a, is a non-starter, but it's bought itself one. And on top of that, in this book, it's uh, embellishing that further with these forgeries and stuff. And finally, I just wanted to give an example of, of the writing in this book. Many of these chapters start with supreme acts of writing. And when they sort of climax uh, with these sort of wonderful events, quite sort of cataclysmic or climactic events, it's not, ne it's not necessarily the quality of the writing and the descriptive and the metaphors. It's just the situations are so funny. You know, the point at which that you've built up gradually to these crazy situations and the payoff. 
that is the sort of the level of plot that I took from this. That the, as I say, individual events are done so well. That is Gaddis as a plot writer, and what I'm about to read is Gaddis as a wordsmith. So again, this notion of painting, which is obviously a constant um, theme of the book. Early on in the book, I got the sense of Gaddis's descriptions were as if you were looking at paintings, perhaps even as if you were studying um, the Stations of the Cross. I mean, not literally, because the, the, the scenes being portrayed here are not those from the Stations of the Cross, but that sort of element of looking at a picture and contemplating and meditating on it, Gaddis gives us. So this is, uh, I think, uh, part one, chapter six. This is the start of it. Otto uh, has pulled uh, a woman the night before and has woken up in his bed. This is the very start of the chapter. Why has not man a microscopic eye, writes Alexander Pope? For this plain reason, man is not a fly. What of Argus, equipped with 100 eyes to watch over the king's daughter, turned into a heifer by a jealous goddess? How many images of the heifer did he see? How many leaves to the bracken? where she browsed, and after the death of Argus, his eyes transplanted to the peacock's tail. This wretched heifer, the metamorphosis of Io, was visited by a gadfly sent by the jealous goddess, and driven frenzied across frontiers until she reached the Nile. What did the gadfly see? An Argos, an Argus, suffering the distraction of one hundred eyes, did he sit steady? or move distracted from distraction by distraction, like the housefly now dashing and retreating in frenzy against the window pane, drawn to a new destination the instant it halted, from the shade pool to the floor, from there to the lampshade, back to the baffling window glass. No Argus, this miserable diptera, despite its marvellous eye guardian of nothing. For where was the heifer? Below, perhaps. From the high ceiling, the housefly careened to the moulding across the room, thence to the lampshade, to a green muffler, a pair of socks on the floor, and so to the sleeping face which it attended with custodial devotion, until the blinking, unmicroscopic eyes came open, and Otto lay awake. Oh God, what have I done? came borne on a girl's voice, sustained by a muted radans, singing before his judges from the lungs of a radio. Otto closed his eyes, not yet ready to return to this life. The fly rummaged about his cheek, remarking there the pitted damages of adolescence and an even surface affording foothold for claws laden with typhoid bacilli. Still, for a moment, the fly studied the caves of the nostrils leading into the crooked, tanned peak of the nose. Otto threw his arm across his face. The fly rose, swirled, returned to walk across the cleft of the chin, and from that eminence sighted the convoluted marvel protruding across the way and leapt silently to the ear. So I just think that's genius writing. It starts off with this sort of intellectual uh, meditation on, on the imagery of Argus and the many eyes and stuff. And then we move from that to an actual fly in Otto's room, who is sort of transcribing the room. And then we move to Otto. So we've gone from the sort of the divine to the very, very mortal. And Otto, to me, in that writing, Otto is painted by the fly. The fly defines and describes Otto's disposition in bed with a hangover. It's genius. I, I cannot say, stress how much of this book there is writing of set pieces. And this isn't even a big climactic set piece scene of lots of characters, but there's lots of individual characters are portrayed by external paintbrushes, the paintbrush being Gaddis's use of words. But here's one specific example. The paintbrush is a fly, and what it is trapped in a room. I mean, what a brilliant, brilliant device. And I just, you know, as I say, I found this book so rewarding, even though I wouldn't say for one moment I got the whole point of it. And there is something about sort of Gaddis constantly returning to these themes of real art and fake art and and soul and and you know hackery and all all those sorts of stuff you know over 956 pages in places it does it does lag a little it's like yeah yeah you've said you've made this point before william kind of move on almost um 
but I just, you know, I just thought it was fantastic. And I, I mean, I hope these aren't spoilers. I'm not going to specify which characters um, it attends to. I mean, there's quite a high body count in this book. Interestingly, although it starts off with the death of the mother and then Aunt May's death, there aren't that many deaths until really you get into the last part of part two and part three when the body count is ratcheted up and two characters die. They're consumed by their passions. One is music and um, in a hilarious sort of climax to the, the whole book, a character who's dreamed of playing his com composed organ uh, sort of mass or whatever in one particular church on their organ in Italy, he finally is able to realise his dream. And it ends up killing him because the, some of the bass notes set up a resonance in the old church, medieval church, and it collapses on him and he dies. Um, but it's, you know, so he dies for his passion, but he dies in a sort of offhand, casual, accidental way. It's not, he, he is consumed, but almost sort of um, by, you know, by chance. It's not, it's not the sort of, consumption by passion that will lead you to ascend to heaven it's it's a very sort of mundane collapse of object building and then another character that her passion in the end turns out to be uh, religion which of course is a huge theme in here and she dies from an infection that she contracts by kissing uh, the foot of a statue a religious statue uh, which has been kissed by many many people before of course you know would be a a vector of transmission of disease we know all too well from uh, things like AIDS and the current pandemic. So she too is consumed by her passion, but again, not in a wholly uplifting way deserving of ascension, but again, offhand, casual. And again, I think this is this is Gaddis at his, his satirical best, poking fun at people's passions because they don't quite get it. They think that they think they're doing it for the right reasons, but actually they're not. Um, and it, yeah, fabulous, you know, 4.75 stars. I only knock a quarter of a star because it's 956 pages. Does every word have to be in there? To my mind, no, but most of them absolutely have to be in there. So great stuff. Next year, I'll be reading JR. I have read Gaddis before this, um, but, you know, this is obviously, his, and it, you know, this was his debut as well, which is another extraordinary uh, thing to contemplate. So there you have it, the recognitions. I, you know, if you like challenging reads, if you like uh, satire, but 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 clever satire, not dumb satire. If you're interested in the world of art, religion, and the soul, I, you know, this this is a book for you. Till next time, thanks very much.